So let me introduce our first speaker, and it's a pleasure to do so. Um, Jeremy Balenson is the founding director of Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. He's an associate professor in the Department of Communication and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. He and his lab uh, design and study virtual, si virtual reality systems that allow physically remote individuals to meet in virtual space. And he studies the manner in which these systems change the nature of verbal and nonverbal interaction. In particular, he is exploring how virtual reality can change the way people think about education, environmental behavior, and health. So please help me welcome Jeremy Balenson. So my name is Jeremy, and um, I want to start out by saying, Martha, uh, thank you for organizing this. If you were to tell me in 2003 when I arrived at Stanford that we were going to have a dedicated conference about immersion and virtual reality, I would have just been stunned and delighted. And uh, it's really special that you're throwing this today. And when I look in the audience, I see basically a who's who of VR. It's really neat to see you guys here. Uh, and thank you all for coming. So. Um, my background, uh, my PhD was in cognitive psychology, and after being trained in cognitive psychology in, in the year 1999, I decided to abandon that field and take a postdoc working under Professor Jim Blaskovich at UC Santa Barbara to learn how to build and test immersive virtual reality. So I learned how to do the engineering and the software, how to do VR. I also learned how to ask bigger, more social questions. And so what I do here at Stanford in the Department of Communication if you believe virtual reality is a medium, which I do, and I think all of you do given that you're here, we study media the same way that you'd study the newspaper, how it affects a reader, or television, how it affects the viewer. So what we do in my lab is we build VR, and we test to see what you can do with it. Now, so I've been studying VR since the late 90s. When I first started, we used this device for a head-mounted display. Anybody remember the Virtual Research V8? Nick, I know you remember this. That's Nick Yee in the background. So he did his dissertation. He wrestled with this thing for 80, 90 hours a week. So this thing cost $13,000. And when I arrived at UC Santa Barbara in the late 90s, this is what we were using. Now, this is a good HMD. I used this up until the year 2011. And we might have even used it in a study in 2012. So it's a pretty good HMD, $13,000. We then switched to the Envis SX111. OK, so uh, I'm not going to tell you how much my car cost when I bought it new, but this thing costs 1.5x of my car when I bought it new. Very expensive piece of hardware, OK? $40,000 to buy this thing. And it's a nice HMD. We used this up until holiday season last year. Then what we get is this arms race that you're all aware of with Samsung and Oculus Facebook and Sony and HTC Valve and Google getting in the game. And Zuckerberg produces this thing, the DK2, which costs about 300 bucks. And it's just a spectacular head-mounted display, just a spectacular head-mounted display. So we decided to replace this $40,000 paperweight, which it is now. And I love the folks at Envis. They're brilliant. Uh, but this is a better HMD. It costs 300 bucks. And now we have this magical event that occurs on Sunday, how many of you guys subscribe to the New York Times? Did you get this? A couple of you. If you are a paper subscriber to the Times, it came with a Google Cardboard. It came pre-folded, and it literally took me 90 seconds to take my smartphone, download an app, slide it inside, and I got to see a piece called the Displace that accompanied a news story. So we went from my entire career, and I've been doing this for 20 years, HMDs used to cost what a car costs, it went to costing what a video game console costs. And as of last week, huge organizations are mailing me stuff to make me watch VR. So it's a very, very special time in the history of this technology. All of us in this room that have been working on this for so long, we really are at a tipping point where the tech is now available. So the home run question that everybody asks me, because we run a lab with brilliant PhD students, brilliant collaborators, uh, and our job at the lab is first and foremost to understand how the mind responds to virtual reality, but consequently to build applications that actually work in VR. What are good uses of it? And so for the rest of the 15 minutes I have your attention, we're going to accomplish three things. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is this concept called psychological presence. 
psychological presence, which drives everything that makes virtual reality special. And then I'm going to talk about two projects. One is using virtual reality as a way to teach about climate change. And the second is going to be about training athletes, uh, an academic study that we ran in my lab that has since become a company from one of my former students that's out in the world doing uh, substantial things. So let's start with presence. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been in VR where you can walk around, not just look around, raise your hands high? So about 10% of you. So uh, five weeks ago, in my lab, uh, CBS came in to film 60 Minutes. And the Sunday night CBS news anchor, who's a very lovely person, really enjoyed spending time with him. He put on the HMD. And uh, months before, we had met with uh, a fire chief in the Bay Area. Um, and we also were preparing for a meeting that we had this past week with the California Earthquake Authority. And what we'd built was an earthquake simulator. Okay? What makes virtual reality special, if you think about VR, one of the grandfathers of VR is the military. In 1929, we had the Link Flight Simulator. And why would you have a flight simulator? Because mistakes are free in VR. It feels real, but you can make mistakes without hurting people, without crashing planes. So extend that up to earthquakes. What we built was an earthquake simulator. You're in a room. There are these boxes stacked up. You put on the head-mounted display, and you can actually walk around the room. And we then hit the button. The earthquake starts. The sound starts rumbling. We actually, in my lab, have a floor that shakes. Uh, the way you save your life is there's a steel table. And so you have to get on your hands and knees and go underneath this table. So back to the CBS news anchor. The simulation was so real that when he started it up, he dropped, stopped, dropped, and rolled, got underneath the table, and we've got this stack of boxes. Now in our simulation, the stack of boxes works with what's called a physics module. Every time we cause an earthquake, something different happens with these boxes. For the first time in history in my lab, we'd run this thing thousands of times. When the boxes fell, some random ricochet happened, and one of the boxes went underneath the table he was cowering under this table to save his life, went underneath the table and smashed into him. And what happened, and keep in mind, he had three cameras trained on him every nanosecond. This is CBS 60 Minutes, right? They, they do this right. He had a panic attack, and he got up, and he sprinted to the wall, and I literally had to tackle him to make sure that he didn't smash into the wall. All the while, three cameras trained right on him. Okay? Uh, so the executive producer made the right decision, did not air that portion. Uh, <laughs> but this is what's called presence. The simulation feels real. The brain tells you that it's real. So Byron Reeves, one of my colleagues, published a famous book called The Media Equation. I often steal his line when I say that the brain has not yet evolved to differentiate a compelling media experience from an actual experience. And what makes VR special is this paradox. It feels real, but there's no rules. You can cause earthquakes. You can fast forward in time. You can see yourself change in a mirror. Anything that any animator could ever imagine is possible in VR. And this is what we call presence, which is it feels real, but in VR there's no rules. OK, I'll talk about two projects. The first project is about ocean acidification. So uh, how many of you guys have heard of ocean acidification? Raise your hands. About a quarter of you. That's OK. Most smart people haven't, which is why my colleague Roy P., who's sitting in the front row in here, and I are doing a really nice project here. So it turns out 20% of human-produced carbon dioxide gets absorbed by the oceans. When this happens, a chemical reaction that we learned about in seventh grade occurs, which is the pH level of the water goes down. The ocean becomes more acidic. In the last 200 years, the acidity of the ocean has increased by 25%. And that rate is accelerating. So when humans produce CO2, we know the oceans become more acidic. The question that we need to answer is, what happens to all the oceans when the acidity goes up, when the pH level goes down? What's going to happen? And we know the answer. Why do we know the answer here? Because one of our brilliant colleagues at Stanford, her name is Phil McKelly, and she studies a very special reef off the island of Ischia. How many of you guys have been to Ischia? It's off of Italy. Two of you. Have you guys dove the reefs of Ischia? Yes? Are you a marine scientist? Ah, very good, very good. So off the island of Ischia, right next to this beautiful castle, is a very special reef. This reef has these underwater volcanic vents, and they spew pure carbon dioxide. This is very rare. Typically, when there's a volcano, the underwater vents spew uh, sulfur or other toxic chemicals that destroy the reef. But this has pure CO2. Why this is important is think of this reef as a canary in a coal mine. 
It's a crystal ball into the future, and it shows how all of the world's oceans will look if humans continue to produce carbon dioxide. So my colleague, Fiona Kelly, and her former student, Christy Croker, who's now a professor at UC Santa Cruz, they published these findings. They study this reef as marine scientists. They published these findings in the best journals on the planet, Science, Nature, all these great journals, yet still in a room of really smart people in Stanford, two, three quarters of you haven't heard of ocean acidification. So just to give you the answer here, by the year 2100, uh, the oceans are going to be, there's not going to be any fish for you guys to eat. It's going to be mm -hmm. devastating. And this is not my claim. This is very well-trained marine scientists. No controversy uh, politically, like there is global warming. We just know that if we keep producing CO2, the oceans will become more acidic and all the fish are going to die. So how do we get people to understand that? What we've done is we've built a spectacular, and I can brag about this because all I did was to hire really smart people and hire good designers to build what's a uh, gorgeously scientifically valid version of this reef. It, every single creature is modeled perfectly. We spent over a year and a half going back and forth with the software company and the marine scientists. We've built a version of this reef where you put on the helmet and you actually swim around and you can grab objects and look at them. And then what we can do is we have you swim closer to these vents. Remember, the closer you get to these vents, the farther in the future you project because all the oceans absorb CO2. These underwater vents show you what the future will be like. And when you get to the year 2100, you look around and the scene is covered with algae. There's no fish for you to eat. Uh, all the urchins and snails are gone and you get a very experiential, scientifically valid field trip into what the future of all of our oceans are going to look like. So uh, Dr. P and I have been working for over two years to really build this field trip, and we're happy to announce that in about four or five months, we are going to release this to the world for free. It's going to be an educational experience where anyone who has any of these types of pieces of hardware can just go and learn. So uh, one of the home runs of VR, in my opinion, are carefully crafted educational experiences that give you a constructivist way to learn about something new. And again, I don't think that VR should replace the classroom, but right now it's a very special time where you can bring field trips to people. So I can't fly all of you, I can't fly the whole world to Ischia, this would be counterproductive in terms of fossil fuel, but I can bring direct experience to you guys so that you have a good sense of what the oceans will be like. Next project I want to talk about is athletic training. And so this story begins in 2005. Uh, at the time, Derek Belch, who was a field goal kicker for the Stanford team, he takes my class COM 166, which is virtual people. And he comes to me after class. He says, Jeremy, can we use virtual reality to train football players? And I said, Derek, it's a brilliant idea. But the technology is just not there yet. I mean, this thing weighs five pounds. It really hurts your neck. You can't really be running around a field with it. Uh, Fast forward to the year 2014, Derek comes back to Stanford to do his master's thesis in my lab. Simultaneously, he's an assistant coach on the Stanford football team. And so his thesis is building a system that we can use to train the three Stanford quarterbacks how to recognize defenses and how to make decisions when they go up to the line of scrimmage. So uh, we spent a lot of time figuring out a way with a spherical camera rig, which back then was very experimental. Uh, now it's a bit more commonplace. We figured out how to go onto practice, plant this rig, and to be able to capture uh, about 10 scenes where all the players are standing in the right places and they're moving around. And then what we would do, we would, every Monday, Coach Shaw was kind enough to donate five minutes of practice. Five minutes of practice is a really big deal uh, for coaches to give this up. So he allowed us to steal five minutes of his practice. And then the players, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, they would train in the simulator. They'd put on the head-mounted display, this one right here. And they would go over plays. They'd get what's called repetitions. And athletics, repetitions are the gold standard. Practice, 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 practice. Uh, with college rules, you're only allowed 20 hours total to be practicing. That includes team meetings. What this gave our quarterbacks and our running backs was the ability to get extra repetitions and to do better mental visualization. So Coach Shaw sees this. Um, Loves it, decides to make it mandatory for all the team members to do this. So it goes from an optional thing to something that's part of what he believes practice should be. Uh, and Coach Shaw will tell you wonderful things about uh, how it's helped his players. And you can read these quotes if you search. Uh, but the fun story, I know we have a lot of corporate folks here today. Derek Belch, in true Stanford style, he graduates January 2nd. January 3rd, he forms a startup. It's called Striver. And in 
It's now November in 11 months. Uh, he has put this system in six NFL teams headquarters. He's put it in over 12 college teams, including Oregon, who just beat us last night uh, on this Saturday. But we, we sold it after we played them. Uh, he sold it to them after we played them. Um, people are using this. And for me, as someone who's been doing this for 20 years, if you were to say that we're going to take my $40,000 head mount display and leave it in the film room for the Dallas Cowboys for the players to beat it up, I would have said, there's no way we can do that. But there are about 60 of these systems floating around. You know, there's one, the uh, Washington Wizards, a basketball team is using it. Uh, professional hockey teams are using it. There's about 60 of these things floating around with professional athletes using this for hours a day. And it's working. Meaning, what does it mean that it's working? Uh, it's not breaking. If you do the metrics on players, they're improving the ones that are doing this. And I just see it as one of the great success stories of we've all talked for a long time, how can you use immersion for training? And what Derek has found is an application that worked when it was a Stanford thesis, and he's built a company uh, with uh, teams that are really happy using it. So uh, I want to save some time for Q&A, so I'm delighted to take your questions. Thank you.